Tonight on The Renault Show, I sit down with Australian actor and chippy Rowan Howard to talk about building the perfect deck. We hear the top bathroom trends from 2018 from Australia's leading interiors publisher. I'll be revealing how you can create wealth the right way renovating property. We hear from our money mindset mentor herself, Denise Duffield-Thomas, and I sit down with one of the top real estate agents in the country to talk about this year's market trends. Welcome to The Renault Show. Now, Rowan. Yes. I have had many people ask me about how to build a deck, literally like the anatomy of a deck. The anatomy of a deck. And I absolutely have had to chat to them about the fact that it isn't a templated um, experience. Like it's literally not, you know, you put this size here and that size there and this is how far between your spans because it obviously completely depends on height off ground. It completely depends on overall size. That's right. You know, depending on how big the overall size Whether you're going to put a roof on top of it. Exactly. What sort of floor covering you're going to put on it. Whether it's going to be attached to your building or separate from your building. Yeah, whether it's, it's going to be freestand. That's right. If it's going to be in ground or above ground. You know, so many variables, so, so many, many variables. variables. However, there is a basic anatomy to a deck. Yes, there's certain components of a deck that will always be there. So Correct. Should we have a chat about that? I think we need to. Let's have a chat about that. Okay, so um, the first thing we start with, obviously, when building anything is from the ground up. So Absolutely. If, we're, uh, if we're building our deck on posts, which is the standard way to do things because inevitably your, your deck is elevated to some degree. Yes. Um, then we're putting our posts in the ground and we're concreting them in there with footings. And footings are a, an engineered designed requirement. So you need to um, consult uh, an engineer to design your footings for you because lots of things affect how big your footings need to be. Yep. So there's soil type, there's load, Yep. bearing above how it. big the hole needs how to be, how wide needs to be, be, the type of concrete you need to That's use. That's very important. Strength, we should talk about that later. Rigidity, those sort of things. So um, in general, your footings are going to be a hole. Normally, it's going to be a bare minimum of 600 millimeters deep. Um, Get that shovel out. Yeah, and it's going to be at least whatever post you're putting in there, you want to make sure you have at least 100 millimeters of concrete entirely all the way around that post so if you've got a hundred so you can't use a post hole, di post hole digger no, and just slot and just the post slot in. that sucker in there that ain't gonna work well it'll work for a little while but <laughs> then it won't yeah, last long that's right you want a quick sale on that so um i didn't say that by the way um so yes you want to get your um your footings designed so you make sure they've got the the right yep. consistency and the right amount of uh concrete in there and then you're going to be using your post to carry either a timber post or a steel post which yep. is quite common as well depending on uh, the area that you're working in or um, the height as well of your deck. So if you've got a deck that's quite high, you'll often go to steel posts just to get yep. the extra rigidity and um, have a bit of cross bracing there to help keep that whole stu uh, structure stable. Um, and then from the posts, you're gonna go to a bearer. All right, so, so our bearers sit on top of our posts. Of our posts, yes. Yeah. So your post will come up either underneath this or it'll fix this way through um, the bearer and into the post on the other side, and you'll have a, either you can have a slight check out of your post to sit your bearer on it, or you can just bolt straight groove. through. Groove. Yeah, sorry, a groove. <laughs> check out. A groove, check out, yes. <laughs> Good this job. Is, <laughs> it's like we're at Woolies again. <laughs> yeah. um, so that would be your bearer, which will normally be a, a fairly large timber size because it's carrying a lot of weight. Obviously. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. And then that will form the, the main sort of skeleton, the exoskeleton, if you'd like, of your, um, of your uh, deck. And then your bearer uh -huh. will have your joist that will either sit across it or in some cases your joist can butt into your bearer and you'll have a joist holder there that will hold yeah, it as well. Yeah, a little lovely stirrup a holder. A lovely little stirrup. So you, uh, and that's another thing to think about too. If you've got limited space to elevate your deck, that means that you can run your joist into your bearer so you save 
that little bit of height on your joists. Some well. of the greatest places that I've seen that work, where you really need to keep as as minimal of your exoskeleton raising sort of the height of your deck, is if you're wanting to put a, a ground cover kind of deck over like an existing horrible like tiled yeah, veranda or yeah. yucky slab of concrete, that rather than ripping it up and digging big post holes, you can actually go, right, I'm going to use the rigidity of the really ugly concrete. I'm actually going to help that support my deck. And in those cases, you need to be really careful of your door heights. Yeah, that's right. And so that's where, as Ryan was saying, it's fantastic to be able to use a stirrup and butt this in rather than, you know, than top mount it. That's right. Um, because you really keep your whole deck really low and, and streamlined. That's right. That's right. And the, this is what ties the, the bears. So the bears will go around the outside, so they've got a bit of lateral movement. And once you, once you put all your joists on, you'll really tighten all that up. And then this is what you're going to fix your decking. This to. isn't a decking board that pretty no. much we'll go across our decking that. boards just go all the way across That's there. That's right. So it's important too to think about that when you're planning your deck. Oh, oh it's so important. Which to way do you want your decking boards to run? Because <laughs> that's going to be perpendicular or at right angles to the way your joist is going to run. So essentially your bearers are going to run parallel with your decking board. So have a little think about the way you're For me, that's that. one of the first things. Yeah. It's how do I want my decking boards to run? That's and right. some of that's based on aesthetic. Some of it's based on lengths. You know, that's if right, you yeah. have a long skinny deck, you know, a lot of people won't want them sort of running across that. They'll want it running down it. So that's one of my first decisions. Before I start to go sketch up how I want or how I need to build my deck, I'll always go, right, which way do I need my decking boards to run? And that then depicts which way I need my my bear is running. That's right. So it's kind of like a planning from the top down, but building from the bottom up arrangement. Very well said. Yeah, that just came to me just then. <laughs> there you have it. Basic anatomy of a deck. Up now with us is Jen Bishop from Interiors Addict. Hi, now, Naomi. Hi. I know Jen's going to be very humble and blush when I say this, but it is our country's leading interiors blog which is a big, big name, Jen. It's very generous of you. Oh, she's very <laughs> humble. So I've got here with Jen with us today, basically, because if there's one person in the industry that gets to see what's coming up, what's happening, what's trending, what's not, it's actually Jen in the Interiors Attic blog. So today we're going to be talking about bathroom trends for 2018. Yep. You know what? Because like a bathroom isn't a flash in the pan, you know, like your bathrooms hang out for no, a while. They hang out for a good decade. <laughs> they do, don't usually. they? Usually. So what's happening in bathrooms, in trends this year? Well, um, I think carrying on from last year, the bathroom is a sanctuary more than ever. It's not this utilitarian practical room anymore. That's Obviously right. it has to be. Um, but we have to some, form some function there, yeah, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we do. But it's still a relaxing, beautiful, more of a lifestyle space now. And okay. um, I think probably as a result of that, bathrooms are getting a little bit more um, beautiful and people are being a bit more adventurous. So we're seeing... Um, what sort of things are they doing? Colour. So whereas before... No. Well, okay, so not like the avocado peach okay. bathrooms of, of So not like the year. 60s... Peach pedestals? No, no okay. none of that. All but right. I think we've gone from that. We've gone to uh, very neutral, lots of whites, white, white, and white. Yes. And now um, people are adding colour. So mostly through tiles, um, okay. especially pattern floor tiles. They, they were big last year. They'll be big this year as well. Um, and a lot of um, feature tiles. So whether that's just a niche or... Um, maybe one wall or in your shower, for example, people are doing, you know, maybe like a beautiful handmade turquoise herringbone yep. Yep. tile, something like that. Um, and even down to basins. So we're seeing, for example, um, coloured concrete round basins, you know, in blush pink and that kind wow. of thing. So yeah, you can do a little or or if you're brave, you can do a lot. But Now, with your patterned floor tiles, are you finding that they're a hark back to the era of beautiful tessellated tiles? Is it, is, are you still finding that with the colour in the tiles on the floors? I think so. Um, I think most people are still going to stick with black and white. Okay. And, and then you can go quite classic. But some people are, you know, they're starting to um, bring out those same kind of patterns in, you know, yep. blues and yep. greens and even some multicoloured but in a very muted kind of tones. Okay, so they're still toning it down. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of acceptable. Yeah. There's no bright yellows coming in. Or okay. Hot pink. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> I know. So colour. So that's one of the things that you're seeing yes, in bathrooms? Yes, absolutely. What else? Um, statement tapware. So mm. not so much chrome 
anymore. Um, obviously, matte black was big um, last year. It's not going anywhere. A lot of people said that was a yep. trend that was going to disappear, but so it hasn't. it was predicted to come and go? Yes. And, and you're not I, seeing it? Not at all. Okay. No. I still think that that's big. And um, gold, tapware, and lots of different kinds. So, you know, brushed brass and then more of a high gloss. Um, yeah. And then um, even the sort of deliberately aged look. Like the brass. antique look. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, and along with that kind of aged antique look, um, some people are just loving that kind of traditional washstand look now yes. instead of a vanity. Where Not you very have practical. The, so for those of you who haven't seen sort of the yeah. washstand look, it's where there might be some drawers up underneath your countertop basin, and then it might be literally like an open butcher's block even. Yeah. And you could have baskets, you could just have open shelves. So yeah. if you are a hoarder of cosmetics, it can be a bit of a woe. Yes. But it's a beautiful look. Yes, but you really would only be putting your beautiful things on there. You couldn't have your harpic under there no. out on show. But they, they are Any lovely, but off. probably not the most practical. No. Maybe but for they the are powder beautiful. room. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or for the guest bathroom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're All really right. nice. So washstands have beautiful tapware. Yes. And you know what's interesting when you say about black coming and going? I was only having a giggle to myself. It was literally last week. I was in a large mainstream um, varying price range warehouse yep. and I noticed that there's even really low price point black fi fixtures and fittings now. There definitely is, although how long they'll last is a question. Correct. Yeah, but yeah, it's definitely not just for the high end. There's yeah, the, the, which to me says it's to stay for a while. Exactly, once you see it in your everyday mainstream and stores. And at, every day, at an everyday price point. Exactly, yeah. Then you know that it's not going to run away anytime soon. Yep. All right. Anything else you want to touch on on bathrooms? What's your prediction? What do you think's What do you think is going to go this year? That's been in for a while. Um, I think that people are seeing that the freestanding bath isn't the only bath. Yeah. I think everyone used to love a freestanding bath and sort of squash them into even the smallest bathrooms, which Correct. I know you would say is not the best look and not easy to clean behind. And really impractical. Yeah, so I think people are starting to embrace the fact that you can have a hob bath, you can do and interesting still look things amazing. with them. Yeah, you can tile up the sides, you can do lots of cool things. Absolutely. And what's your take? I think I know your take, <laughs> but it's interesting. Um, so marble was with us for a really long time. It was. It was, and I mean, you can get marble pretty much in everything. You can get marble pencil nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you think that it's going to completely leave and become unfashionable or it's just going to stop being so popular and go back to the amazing classic it always was? Um, I think it will take a while to go. I think it has become oversaturated. Um, Absolutely. It will it, stay around and I think it's okay for it to stay around. In, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful natural material that's always in fashion. But um, I think certainly what was coming out of um, Milan last year, which is yes. where all the big design trends come from, was a yeah. move towards more um, a more subtle kind of marble. So maybe not the Carrara, but the warmer tones and things that yeah. aren't quite as obvious. And even those that maybe hark a little to the limestone. The Absolutely, muted, the yeah, muted those look. kind of colours, yeah. yeah. Yeah, nice. Well, thanks so much. There we have it. If you are renovating your bathroom this year, if you've just renovated your bathroom, you can do maybe a bit of a checklist to see how on point you are with trends if that was your intention. So regardless of what stage of renovating you're up to, it's always good just to have an eye and an ear on the trends and decide what you want to filter and sprinkle across what you're doing in your house. So thanks so much for being with us today, Jen. Thank you. I have a quick question for you before I dive in. So do you find yourself asking whether renovating for wealth is right for you? Are you looking to jump onto the house flipping bandwagon, but you're afraid that you don't have the skills or the know-how to get through a project? Or, or maybe you'd love to earn a few extra dollars renovating on the side but you really don't know how you're going to juggle that and kids and family and commitments and everything else that life seems to throw your way. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's possible to renovate for wealth and still enjoy life. And it definitely doesn't have to be a huge drama or a stress fest like what you see on popular TV shows.
What's that saying? You can have your cake and eat it too? Well, you can. You can renovate and make money, and by doing so, you can create your perfect picture of wealth. Which brings me to exactly what today's post is all about. I have a few tips to help you throw away the fear, kick it to the curb, put it in the bin where it belongs, and help you answer those nagging questions in your head. Now, before we go into really detail, I want you to always keep your end goal in mind. It can be easy to get kind of lost along the way, so don't lose track of what your finish line is. Personally, what you want to get out of a renovation project. So there's no point in jumping into a project that will realistically take time and effort and dollars if you don't know why you're jumping into such a big commitment in the first place. Think of it, I guess, as a contract. Would you sign a contract on the dotted line if you didn't even know what you're signing for? Hmm, so what is your end goal then? Are you looking to get your hands dirty in a serious hobby or use renovating to carve out a nice six figure per year profit generating money machine? As long as you're not looking at renovating as a get rich quick scheme because it is far from that and I want you to avoid that mindset, then renovating for wealth is definitely something you should consider. But just be very mindful. Renovating for wealth involves real properties and real renovations and real materials and real teams. So you should never ever start a project without first doing loads of proper planning thinking and research. Okay, so we have established that having the end goal is super important, right? But wait, what exactly is renovating? Well, let me put it very simply for you. Renovating is pretty much the act of taking a property and making it even more awesome. Have you ever heard someone say, don't fix it if it ain't broken? Well, you know what? The houses don't have to be broken. They could just be in original form that maybe Grandma Doris lived in in the 19th century, baking her apple pies. It doesn't have to be broken to need to be renovated. These kinds of improvements can include fixing what is broken or upgrading things that are on their way out or look a little old and vintage. And this is where your end goal comes in. The improvements can be big or small depending on what your vision and your goal for renovating actually is. Okay, so that explains renovating. But what is renovating for wealth then, I hear you ask? Well, renovating to create wealth. Some call it renovating for profit, some call it house flipping, house rehabbing. There are millions of generic terms that are used every day to describe this. So those renovating shows on TV have definitely popularized the idea of house flipping or creating wealth through renovating property. And everyone wants a piece of the pie. And there's a really popular saying in real estate industry, which is buy low and sell high. And that's pretty self-explanatory right? But exactly how do you sell high? Sure, you can buy the right property and it can sit there for years while riding the market growth if you have some, but that's not what renovating for wealth is all about. And that's not what we're here for, right? What we're looking here is to add value and improvements to each and every property that you choose to renovate and in doing so, make money. So here we are. There's three main steps that you need to get to get that golden high. There's three main phases in renovating for wealth. And the first one is the acquisition phase. So this actually involves when you're purchasing the property. You want to nab it at a price that won't make renovating pointless. I'm talking either at or below market value. But there's no point paying an inflated price for a property that may or may not make you a profit. That risk of loss is not worth your time, money and effort. Now the second phase of renovating to create wealth and this phase is all about improvement. So this is where you're going to be pumping, pumping, pumping value into that property that you scored at or below market value. This is where the renovating actually comes in and it's not just any renovating either. It's super important at this stage to really look at the key elements of the property, including floor plans, including space medicine, including your target market. 
And then we head on to the third phase of renovating for wealth journey. So this phase is the lucky last. It is the final step and it is all about leveraging. So this is the selling part of the renovation project, which is where you get to make your money. Woohoo! The key here is obviously to sell or rent the finished product for a higher value than was possible before you put your time, effort and money into it. So obviously if you don't sell or rent it, you won't really be able to see the added value of the renovation. When you do let it go, you'll have increased capital or equity or rental yield to put into your future projects. Then you can keep renovating to create more wealth. So there you have it. Now you know the three phases that are involved in renovating to create wealth. And you are hopefully better equipped to answer those questions that keep running through your head. And if all of this information is making your hands start to itch for a renovation project of your own, then come and check out the Rapid Renovation Formula and see how we can help you achieve your rapid renovation goals. Well, with me today, I have someone very special and actually someone very dear to me. I have Denise Duffield-Thomas from denisedt.com. So Denise and I have worked together. We have been friends for a really long time. And Denise works in the money mindset area. And many of you are probably going, what? What's this got to do with renovating? Like, what are you doing, Naomi? Where are you going with this reno show? <laughs> Why have you got her here? I have got her here because I cannot endorse enough the importance of manifesting when it comes to the right renovation. So Denise, for all those that are going, has she really lost it? Like, what is she talking about? <laughs> what is manifesting? Well, okay, so I have been a big fan of personal development, self-growth stuff for a long, long time, since I was a teenager, actually. Yeah. But what I noticed in my 20s when I started watching things like The Secret, uh -huh. I was like, this stuff is awesome, but it's not very practical and I'm a Virgo and I like to know what do you actually do? So I knew I wanted to change my life. I knew I wanted to start a business, you nice. know, make more money, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't get how the law of attraction and manifesting actually worked in that. I was okay. like, do I just need to like, do meditate? I hum in a circle? <laughs> I was like, do I just have to buy lots of crystals? Which I did. <laughs> um, so I, what I teach is practical manifestation stuff and manifesting just means make real. Okay. It's, it's as simple as that. So taking things from your dream board or you, just dreams that you have in your life and making them real in the real world. And that takes a bit of a combination of some woo-woo practices. I okay, won't so lie. So a few crystals, a circle and a bit of meditation and... And practical stuff as well. You have to take action. You have to meet the universe halfway. So I teach a, a bit of both. And I think for anything, no matter what you're doing, whether it's you know, buying, selling houses, flipping, renovating, you kind of do need a little bit of assistance sometimes. <laughs> you do. So when she looks yes. up, she means from the universe. Absolutely. So Gnomes and I have worked together quite a few times. She's actually staged quite a few of my houses uh -huh. um, and we've renovated a couple of houses together. And when I say together, Gnomes just told me what to do <laughs> and we did it. I love how honest you are. No, I didn't Gnomes do told anything. Me what to do. Yes, exactly. And she mediated between me and my husband. She moonlights as a marriage counsellor in case you didn't. I actually did You mediate. did, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I have made a ton of mistakes when it comes to property, even selecting property. So I have learnt now to do a combination of the woo-woo and the practical. And I just want to so give you... So expand on that a bit more. Yeah, okay. So what does a combination look like? And especially in the world of property, like people are going, come on, how do I, how do I renovate woo-woo style? Like what does it yes. look like practically for you? Okay, well let me just say first of all about getting a property in the first place because okay. I have bought a lot of properties in the last couple of years and you know a this. A lot of properties. And most of them haven't been the right ones. No. In fact, I even held one for six weeks and I realized it wasn't the right property for me. And That's sold... not six months or six years, everyone? Six, six weeks. weeks. Because it wasn't the right property. So here's what I do now. Okay, first I want to tell you the practical stuff because what I used to do is go into a house and just go, wow, this is cool, like with one aspect of it. 
and I would buy a house that was just not right for me in any way. So the practical side of that is that um, Mark and I, we sat down and wrote a list of everything we both wanted and needed. Okay, perfect. Including going through every house we'd lived in together and we've lived in a lot of houses together yeah. and going, what was great about it and what was terrible? What did you hate? About it. That's right. And then because we've also gone on a lot of holidays, we were like, what was really great about the hotels we visited or the Absolutely. resorts or the Airbnbs? and what was terrible. So it gave us a very practical spreadsheet. So then we could go to properties and actually tick it off. And we got really kind of anal about this. We would give properties you know, a, a score, score? Out, of out of 10 for some aspects, or it would be a yes or no. Like, does it have two car garage? Yes or yes. no. But then it would be like, well, what's the ambience like? So we would give it a score. So that gave us a very practical score for the property. So that's the practical okay. side that we did, right? The woo-woo side, though, Here was a little bit Let's different. Let's do it. Yes. This is where I started to look at what are my beliefs around getting the perfect property? That's a very interesting <laughs> word, isn't it? So it can is. we unpack that a bit? Yes. Okay. So when I realized that house that I bought for six weeks wasn't the right house, I realized it was because a belief I had that I wasn't allowed to live in my dream property. Okay. That was big. I mean, this was a dream. That, that, this was my, the place that I wanted to live in, but it still works for if you're doing a renovation or a flip or, or you're finding your dream house. So what happened was I've always wanted to live at the beach with a beach view. Yes. And actually on like one or two streets. <laughs> so what I didn't realize was for the last couple of years, I'd had that street on my dream board Really, for yep. real? I had used the name of the street in some of my passwords on my computer. Whoa, yes. that's placement. It is. And I'd even changed a few people's names in my phone, like phone contacts, yes. to be their name and then the name of the street. And I do all of these things. I call these positive anchors when yeah. I teach them in my work. And it's about getting, just making your dream top of mind for you all the time. Because when you see it, you can believe it, right? So it becomes real. It becomes real. So. For some reason, though, I bought a house in the suburbs and it was going to be a Hamptons house instead of a beach house. And I realized it was a massive belief. And when I sat down and unpacked the belief for me, it was, I don't deserve to live in my dream house yet. I have to wait and earn it. Oh. <laughs> yes. Or I'm not allowed to have everything I want. Or I'm, I'm not allowed to live near the beach. That's not the kind of person I am to be able to have this. And then a ton of beliefs around properties never come up around here. Or um, You're talking it's yourself too out of it, essentially. I was. I was talking myself out of it. Even though for five years, I remember when we first moved to Newcastle, yeah. we would walk along this street and we'd say, one day we're going to live here. One day we're going to live on this street. And I would walk in the neighborhood and pretend that I was coming home. I, we'd drive up and say, let's just drive. I'm getting chills even talking Man, about it. Man, that's a whole world of visualization and action, isn't it? It is, right? It is, a, it is hardcore. And you know I just bought a house on that street. You did. She did. <laughs> yes. And um, I would just, I remember walking along and saying, one of these houses is our house. I don't even know which one it is, but one of them is. So I had to work on that belief really for years and years and give myself permission that it was okay to have a house on that on the street. Beach. Absolutely. What I wanted, instead of talking myself out of it and telling myself, well, maybe in the future or, you know, maybe in my 50s, then I'll deserve it or some, something. I would have like done that. hard yards. I would have worked long enough hours. I would have I would earned, have earned enough money. Yep. And then I would be able to have it. And so I guess this is so important for all those people that might have that dream in mind or might have that rural property in mind or might, you know, have that aspiration. And hopefully they can see through your story some of the things that they were telling themselves absolutely and you know what sometimes we think that we have to wait till the money shows up trust me when this house came up the money was not there so you have to dream first and then sometimes then you have the motivation to go find the money and because otherwise that if you're is waiting, so interesting it is right if you're waiting it's you're never just going to have the spare money there well in, in our market it. in australia nowadays if you're waiting and it's for your dream house or your dream project or you might be in a house and you're waiting for the money to renovate it um, to add value, to get to the next level, or to sell, or to be your dream property. Um, and you're right, if you're waiting, how often does a tidy 500, a tidy million turn up if you're waiting? Whereas if you set the intention and invite it in, 
You're opening up space for it. So on the woo-woo side of yes. things, on the woo-woo side of things, so I love the Excel. You know I'm like an Excel addict. I'm an Excel lover. Yep. I love a checklist. I love a formula. But I think there's so much that we can do to open up the energy channels and actually allow some of this amazingness in. So can you give me your top three things? <laughs> I was going to say, how woo-woo should we go on this? You can go realistically. <laughs> it's my show. You this, can go as woo-woo as you this want. This might be a whole story for another day. But um, <laughs> no, I actually hired somebody who is a feng shui energy okay. healer yeah. because I said, what's going on? Like, I'm, at, you know, I can't find a dream house, you know, and she actually just did some energy work for me and she did a crystal grid okay as well which sounds really weird no, okay. and so i did a crystal grid at home too which a crystal grid you can just google it but i just put i don't know what i was doing but i just put some lovely crystals and i put a little picture of where i wanted to live and i wrote down you know the address yes. of where i wanted to live and again it was just another positive anchor of of i want this this is what i desire and every time i looked at it i thought yeah, you know what maybe it is possible and every time you do something like that even if you think it's weird or silly Actually, one thing that another thing that Mark and I did, we went and took a picture of the house before we even bought it, and that was my screensaver on my phone. And I, you can put words on it with yep. an app, and I put, you know, this is our new home. Yep. I put in my calendar um, a daily reminder saying congratulations on your new home, and put the address there. Every time that that popped up or I saw my phone, it gave me the belief that it was possible that I was allowed to live there and I was allowed to be the kind of person who would buy that house, if that makes Isn't sense. Isn't that interesting? So really it's about, um, it's obviously about having a spreadsheet, but it's also about uh, like proclaiming. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, like when someone proclaims their love for someone, it's proclaiming your intent, proclaiming your want and continually reminding yourself that it's there and, and that you're open to it. Absolutely, because it was not going to fall into my lap. I had to do, <laughs> you know, I had to really believe it. And also, I remember to, I had to uh, have that belief in myself because other people didn't believe it in me. And I remember going to so many um, open houses around there. No real estate agent would ever talk to me, by the way, because I was always by myself. I was like, you know, dress like a mum, <laughs> have Probably a baby had a on child, me. child, snot running it, down exactly. your shoulder. And so none of the real estate agents in town believed me that I could buy that property. I believed me and um, you know, and Mark, my husband, he started to believe it as well. And so when the opportunity came up, I, it felt divinely guided. Does that make yeah. sense? I was like, well, I've been asking for the opportunity and here and it now is. It's here. So now I have to pull out everything, all the stops to buy this property because it's mine. I like it. That is a perfect <laughs> way to finish this. It is hers. So guys, if you do have a dream reno in, in your sites, or if it is sort of ankle biting you, it's a little idea that's tapping you, mm -hmm. going, oh, imagine imagine the homestead, or imagine an extension, or imagine this, or imagine that, allow yourself to imagine and start taking action. Yeah, I go and visit it, yeah. breathe in the air, and imagine yourself, I would sit there and imagine myself, this is where my office is gonna be. You know, put yourself in that space and, and believe it. And it might not take, you know, forever but every time you do that i think you're making it come to you quicker absolutely you're drawing, you're drawing it, it in you. yeah absolutely drawing in <laughs> thanks so much denise i know that we've got you lined up to come back on some more shows so yeah. i can't wait to see you again soon all right thanks guys happy manifesting All right, everyone, I have with me on the couch right now, Mark Kentwell from PRD Nationwide Newcastle. So Mark's a principal there, and let's admit it up front, he's a bad ass real estate agent. And I've worked with Mark and know Mark for many, many years, and I'm really excited to have him on the couch at the Renault Show today, talking about overcapitalizing. Yes. By the way, I hope badass is like, you know, in a good term. <laughs> badass is bad. a very, pro very, very, very <laughs> positive term. But one of the things, we've worked together for a really long time and we see it all the time, people overcapitalizing. Mm. And I know that you're really passionate about helping people avoid that mistake. Sure. Um, because then it kind of becomes something you need to deal with otherwise. Absolutely. So whether they're renovating to on sell or renovating just to stay in the yeah. home, it's good to do that in a sensible way. <laughs> And there's yes. a few key areas that people tend to overcapitalize on a regular basis. All right, so what's your top one? Okay, top one would probably be in bathroom slash wet areas. Mm -hmm. um, they're really important areas and they're wow factor areas, but there's a difference, I suppose, that's minimal to an end buyer or to the value on, say, tile selection. 
But yep. some tiles are like, you know, $300 a metre and some are 35 And yep. there's a really happy medium in there at maybe 50 or 60 <laughs> where it looks great, it's really unique, but it's and not changing the price. And so do you see sometimes someone's renovated a house and they've been so attached to the $300 a square metre tile and so they're like, oh my gosh, this is worth a fortune. And the buyer coming in is like, wow, they're nice tiles, but I don't imagine that I'd ever pay $300 a square metre for them. Yeah, and you can always even bring it up that they are $300 a square metre. They're like, well, why do they spend that on that? And then they've got this horrible colour scheme or yep. why didn't they actually put an ensuite in the house? Why have we just got one really nice bathroom? The yes. tile difference could have been the extra ensuite. And I don't even get to spend time in there because there's not enough bathroom space and I'm arguing with my kids about the space. Yeah, so it's just about deploying the capital into the right areas and thinking okay. about the greater picture, not just these spot areas where they really want to knock people's socks off. Hey, that's a really interesting point, actually. So it's about vision across the renovation, mm -hmm. not about just focusing on creating like this masterpiece, which realistically, we don't live in our bathrooms. It's great to enjoy them, mm. but we don't live in the bathrooms. Yeah, I think if they start with good design, you know, good colour palette, good understanding of how it's going to flow and how they're going to live in it or the next person's going to live in it, it, they yep. can really save some money on those sort of areas. Okay, so wet areas is number one. What's number two? Uh, I would say fixtures and fittings. Okay. And now these can be throughout the home. And so I, by that, what do you mean? Everyone okay. has a different idea. So let's say uh, tapware in a kitchen. Okay. Let's say <laughs> the handles that you use on doors. Yes. Let's say uh, the, the one light that you put in an area where it's not that high traffic and it's not really high impact. Yep. So I'm not saying don't go to a good standard on these things, but yep. again, like you can get taps that are $900. You can get other taps that are 69 and you can get somewhere in between at that 150 mark that they're really functional, they come with great warranty and they look really great. And they completely fit in with your look and feel. Exactly. So no point going hard in one area and then the rest of the home is lacking. Like I've seen it before where people spend a lot of money on really fancy door sets for example yep. like the handles on the doors but they're really crummy doors like they're the light doors there's no yep. weight in them or they've gone um, through the house with the really high-end light switches yes that have got a beautiful sort of backlit uh, yes. option and maybe there's usb um, in other areas yep. of the home yeah but then there's things that are severely lacking in that house elsewhere yep. that that could like have window furnishings it could have gone towards that and you know what's really interesting you just brought up and it's absolutely a thing of mine so many people will invest beautifully in their door hardware because they like the way it feels when they turn it mm -hmm. but yet for me more impact and more impressive is a solid door internally yes. or even a higher door going for the the more elevation across the design rather than just putting it into the fittings yeah and i think that's why people got to put more value in design at the start mm -hmm. rather than music the to my ears the design. <laughs> i'm not just saying because we're into design either <laughs> but it's true it, about the bigger vision really yeah. all right now, what's your third? I'm okay. inter interested. Yeah, I would say, this is going to sound like gremlins, I think. Gizmos <laughs> and gadgets. Gizmos. They were gremlins. I see they'll call that. So gizmos and gadgets. Now, yep. I'm all about gadgets. I've got all the Apple gear. You I, do. I, and I've got lots of And the of little... watches. Yeah, yeah. Next time on The Reno Show, Rowan's back to give us the best tips for hanging up art and mirrors on your walls. I'll be sharing my top six design principles with you. Jen Bishop will reveal the top kitchen trends for 2018. And Mark Campwell is back to give us the scoop on the Queensland market. As well as Denise. She'll be with us talking about money blocks and how you can get around them. Remember to like and subscribe to our channel to receive weekly renovation and lifestyle inspiration. If you have a question about today's show, leave a comment below and we'll be sure to get straight back to you.